Εξοχωτάτε κύρια πρέσβη, αξιότιμοι συνάδελφοι του Υπουργείου Πολιτισμού και των ξένων αρχαιολογικών σχολών, κυρίες και κύριοι. Καλησπέρα σας. Ονομάζομαι Τζένι Βόλενστεν και είμαι η Διευθύντρια του Σουηδικού Ινστιτούτου Αθηνών. Πριν να ξεκινήσω την εκδήλωσή μας, με πολύ χαρά δίνω το λόγο στην κυρία πρέσβη της Σουηδίας, Σαλότ Σαμελίν. Καλησπέρα σας, κυρίες και κύριοι. Dear ladies, gentlemen, and dear Director Wallenstein, I'm very honored to attend the annual meeting of the Swedish Institute at Athens. This year we have a lot to celebrate. The bicentennial of the Greek Revolution of 1821, 40 years of Greece's membership to the European Union, and 75 years of continuous presence of the Swedish Institute at Athens. The Institute was founded in 1946. It is a non-profit research foundation financed mainly by the Swedish government through the Ministry of Education. The Institute opened its door to scholars and students in 1948 and earned a full status as a so-called foreign archaeological school in 1975. So congratulations to the Swedish Institute. The Institute is conducting research into the culture of ancient Greece, providing higher education in the same field to enrich our own culture. The Embassy, together with the Institute, are supporting the cultural exchange between Sweden and Greece and collaborate often to perform such events. Despite the challenges we are all facing, and faced also last year due to the pandemic, we have managed to maintain a high level of activities that had, of course, to move online, like today's event. I'd like to highlight one example within the framework of UNIC, which is a European network consisting mainly of embassies and national institutes engaged in cultural relations. Last year we collaborated on the European Day of Language and now we're preparing for the European Culture Week 2021 and European Day of Language 2021 and we have some exciting projects in the pipeline. Another important and usual step for us is to see cooperation within the framework that is very natural to us. It is within the Nordic families. The Nordic embassies and the Nordic institutes have collaborated closely in the past and we are now exploring initiatives to continue this fruitful cooperation. I am looking forward to hearing about the valuable and amazing work of the Swedish Institute at Athens during challenging times by Director Jenny Wallenstein. Tonight we will also find out more about the Greek-Swedish archaeological work in Flochos in Kalditsa. This region is very dear to us, as we have many Greek Swedes from Karaditsa in Sweden. And personally, I happen to have some close friends from there. Θα ήθελα να ευχαριστήσω το Σουηδικό Ινστιτούτο και την κυρία Γιάννη Βαλενστέν για την ιδιαίτερος γνώμη συνεργασία με την Πρεσβεία. I hope you have an enjoyable evening. Thank you. Με ιδιαίτερη Χαρά και τιμή σα καλωσορίσω στην ετήσια συνέλευσή μα απόψε, τη διαδικτυακή μορφή τη οποία υπαγόρευσε η πανδημία. Η φετινή παρουσίαση του έργου μα είναι σαφώ πιο συνοπτική για λόγου του οποίου γνωρίζουμε όλοι. Καταφέραμε να πραγματοποιήσουμε μόνο περιορισμένε αρχαιολογικέ έρευνε πεδίο, μόνο μια σύντομη επιχείρηση στο βλοχό τη Θεσσαλία και η απαγόρευση συναθρήσεων είχε ως αποτέλεσμα να ακυρωθούν πολλές προγραμματισμένες διαλέξεις, συνέδρια, πολιτικές, πολιτιστικές εκδηλώσεις. Κοιτάζοντας όμως πίσω, μπορώ με χαρά σήμερα να πω ότι καταφέραμε να φέρουμε εις πέρας ένα σημαντικό μέρος της αποστολής μας και όταν ξεκίνησε το δεύτερο lockdown του Νοέμβρη, Είμασταν προετοιμασμένοι για τους επερχόμενους μήνες ψηφιακούς. Επιπλέον, τα αποτελέσματα των μικρής, μικρής κλίμακας αρχαιολογικών ερευνών, ερευνών στο Βλοχό αποδείχτηκαν εξαιρετικά ενδιαφέροντα, 
άξισαν στην πραγματικότητα μια διάλεξη αφηρημένη αποκλειστικά σε αυτά και θα ακούσουμε περισσότερο αυτό σε λίγο όταν μετά από μια εισαγωγική ομιλία της προεσταμένης της εφορίας αρχαιοτήτων Καρδίτσας, κυρίας Μαρίας Βαϊοπούλου, ο κύριος Ρόμπιν Ρενλουντ θα παρουσιάσει τα αποτελέσματα της Έλενος του Ειδικής Συνεργασίας στο Βλοχό. Πριν ξεκινήσω την παρουσίασή μου, θα ήθελα, όπως πάντα, να ευχαριστήσω τους, τους συναδέλφους μας στο Υπουργείο Πολιτισμού και Αθλητισμού και τις τοπικές εφορίες αρχαιοτήτων για τη βοήθειά τους. Καταρχάς, ευχαριστούμε θερμά τον Υπου... του Υπουργείου Πολιτισμού που μας παροχωρεί τις απαραίτητες άδειες. Θα ήθελα να εκφράσω τις ευχαριστήσεις μας στον Γενικό Γραμματέα του Υπουργείου, στον κύριο Γιώργο ε, Διδασκάλου, στη προϊσταμένη της Γενικής Διεύθυνσης Αρχαιοτήτων και Πολιτιστικής Κληρονομιάς, κυρία Πολυξένια Δαμπελένη, στη προϊσταμένη της Διεύθυνσης Προϊστορικών και Κλασικών Αρχαιοτήτων, κυρία Έλενα Κοντούρη, και στην κυρία Ιουλία Παπαγεωργίου, αναπληρώτρια προϊσταμένη της Διεύθυνσης Βυζαντινών και Μεταβυζαντινών Αρχαιοτήτων και προϊσταμένη του Τμήματος Εποπτείας Ελληνικών και Αλλουδαπών Επιστημονικών Ιδρυμάτων και Συντονισμού Θεμάτων Διεθνών Συνεργασιών και Οργανισμών της Διεύθυνσης Βυζαντινών και Μεταβυζαντινών Αρχαιοτήτων. Στο Τμήμα Εποπτείας Ελληνικών και Αλλουδαπών Επιστημονικών Ιδρυμάτων και Συντονισμού Θεμάτων Διεθνών Συνεργασιών και Οργανισμών της Διεύθυνσης Προϊστορικών και Κλασικών Αρχαιοτήτων, εκφράσουμε την ευνομοσύνη μας στη προϊσταμένη κυρία Κωνσταντία Ναμπενίση και στη κυρία Γιώργια Φακάρου. Η στήριξή τους είναι πάντα πολύτιμη. Ευχαριστούμε θερμά την προεσταμένη της Εφορίας Αρχαιοτήτων Αργολίδας, κυρία Άλκη στη Παπαδημητρίου και από την ίδια εφορία την κυρία Αγγελική Κόσιβα. Επίσης, θα θέλαμε να ευχαριστήσουμε τη κυρία Κέτη Δημακοπούλου, την κυρία Νικολέτα Βαλάκου, για τη συνεργασία στη Μηδέα. Εκφράζουμε τις ευχαριστίες μας στην Εφορία Αρχαιοτήτων Καρδίτσας, στη προεσταμένη κυρία Μαρία Βαϊοπούλου, στον τμήματάρχη κύριο Κώστα Βουζατσάκη, στην αρχαιολόγο Φωτεινή Τσούκα και στον δήμαρχο Γιώργο Σακελαρίου. Ευχαριστούμε την προϊσταμένη της εφορίας της Μεσενίας, κυρία Ευαγγελία Μιλίτση και Χαλιά, και στην ίδια εφορία τον κύριο Σταμάτη Φριτσίλα. Τις θερμές μας ευχαριστίες και στην προϊσταμένη της εφορίας αρχαιοτήτων περιός και νήσων, κυρία Στέλλα Χρυσουλάκη, και στην ίδια φορία τη κυρία Μαρία Γιανοπούλου. Στα Χανιά, οι ευχαριστίες μας απευθύνονται στη προϊσταμένη της εκεί εφορίας αρχαιοτήτων, κυρία Ελένη Παπαδοπούλου και στη κυρία Ευτυχία Πρωτοπαπαδάκη, όπως επίσης στη κυρία Μαρία Ανδρεαδάκη Βλαζάκη, τέος Γενική Γραμματέα. Θα ήθελα επίσης να ευχαριστήσω όλους τους συναδέλφους και φίλους μας στη βιβλιοθήκες της Αθήνας και του εξωτερικού, οι οποίοι βοήθησαν τους, έρευνε, τους ερευνητές του Ινστιτούτου, ειδικά εμένα, κατά τη διάρκεια των εκτεκταμένων περίοδων, όπου υπήρξαν κλειστές οι βιβλιοθήκες. Ευχαριστώ προσωπικά την κυρία Σουσάννα Επιρώτη της βιβλιοθήκης Μπλέγγεν, τους Πάτρικ Ταλάτας και Γιάννς Μάγνερουδ της βιβλιοθήκης των Βορείων Χωρών. Ένω λίγος, Αγαπητοί συνάδελφοι, η υποστήριξή σας, τόσο επαγγελματική όσο και ηθική, δεν ήταν λιγότερο σημαντική φέτος, παρά τις περιορισμένες δραστηριότητες μας, υπήρξε κατά κάποιο τρόπο ακόμα πιο φουσποδαία. Το Σβηδικό Ινστιτούτο και εγώ προσωπικά ανυπομονούμε να συνεχίσουμε τις συνεργασίες μας, υποσχετικά φυσιολογικές συνθήκες, μόλις του επιτρέψει η επιδημιολογική κατάσταση. Και τώρα θα συνεχίσω στα αγγλικά για τον απολογισμό του έργου του Σουηδικού Ινστιτούτου του 2020. I now turn to English for a brief account of the activities of the Swedish Institute, perhaps for the first time in our 
history of 75 years without accounting for archaeological fieldwork, as this year's limited campaign gave us an excellent opportunity to let the invited speaker present this in detail, as well as in the larger context of the Sinergasia established in 2016. We could, however, continue some archaeological work in the context of our efforts to strengthen our infrastructure for future research. Together with the Swedish institutes in Rome and Istanbul, we are creating a digital platform which will contain, in the end, hopefully, all material from Swedish excavations in the Mediterranean, from identified objects to diaries, maps, relevant correspondence, etc. And in this context, work was carried out in relation to the excavations in ancient Calabria, with focus on, on zooarchaeological remains and lithics. Furthermore, studies within the context of our associated research projects could be carried out during the periods between lockdown. Currently, uh, four studies are conducted by scholars uh, connected to the Institute. Three are funded by Riksbanken's Jubileumsfond. Uh, Christian Joransson, who is working with ancient Cyrenaea, Andrés Chalin, working with Mycenaean figurines, and Naure Sato, working in the context of social anthropology. Uh, she is studying vulnerability and resilience of Yazidi and Assyrian refugees in a transit migration context. Uh, we are also happy to mention the research, the associated research of tonight's speaker, Dr. Robin Rundod, who initiated his project as a Venegrin Fellow based at the University of Thessaly. Uh, the project is called Cyclic Cities, Urbanization and De-Urbanization in Archaic to Roman Times. Uh, we were able to welcome a live audience to a few gatherings before mid-February for an event Co-organized with the Finnish Institute at Athens, Dr. Petra Pakkonen gave a lecture entitled From Skin to Tanned Leather. The Athens Greek Religion Seminar managed to congregate a few times. Um, and in Sweden, uh, together with the Association of Friends of the Institute, we organized a one-day seminar on Swedish nurses and doctors who traveled to Greece to help during periods of war from the Balkan Wars and into the 20th century. There are absolutely amazing stories to be told, stories of courage in archives in Sweden, in Greece and other countries, telling of nurses and female doctors traveling to help out as early as the late 19th century. We are currently reprising these lectures online this spring, but although they're certainly worthy of a larger audience, I'm afraid you'll have to brush up on your Swedish if you wish to enjoy them. We had our hopes up for resuming real gatherings of the summer, but as all of us, we had to switch to digital lectures and seminars. So for the first time ever, in September, the Danish, the Finnish, the Norwegian and Swedish institutes joined forces for a joint digital annual meeting with introductory greetings by Her Excellency, the Swedish Ambassador to Greece, Mrs. Charlotte Samelin, and Dr. Polixeni Adam Veleni, Director of the General Directorate of Antiquities of the Hellenic Ministry of Culture. And I take the opportunity of thanking my fellow directors of the other Nordic Institutes, Kristina Winter Jakobsen, Jure Nökland, and Björn Forsén, who all left their positions as directors. Uh, I thank them for an excellent and very enjoyable cooperation and I wish them all the best with their future academic adventures. Furthermore, in late autumn, the Athens Greek, Religioner went, uh, the Athens Greek Religion Seminar went digital and the assistant director of the Swedish Institute, Dr. Patrick Klingboy, organized a very successful online workshop, New Currents in Ancient Water Studies. 2020 also saw the publication of a new Opuscula, the scientific journal of the Swedish Institutes in Athens and Rome. And we were happy to see that this year's volume continued, se uh, included several articles from Greek colleagues and relating to the work of the Institute. The Institute was moreover able to welcome two scholarships holder, Gurkem Chimen, 
who worked on her MA thesis treating water management in Greek sanctuaries, and Julian Waring, who worked on the zooarchaeological material from the excavations in ancient Calabria. Moreover, and I would say miraculously, a two-month window opened so that we were able to give our university course uh, an MA level on-site traveling seminar that has been the core of the Institute's activities since its foundation. Restaurants and hotels literally closed the day after the students left uh, Greece and uh, I can still not believe our luck that we actually managed to go through with it. And I, was, I want to send a greeting to the students. I was very impressed with their patience and stamina. I hope they'll soon be able to return to Athens to enjoy the full, the true Athens academic life filled with lectures, seminars, and perhaps most exo exotic of all nowadays, receptions. And I wish to extend a special thank you to our assistant director, Poti Klingboy, and our administrators, Eleni Androvic and Katerina Gabierakis, who had to work very hard with this program to make it work through inventiveness and a lot of work with last minute changes. The mission, many of our projects uh, in our program of cultural events went digital in 2020. Now, the mission of the Swedish Institute is focused on research and education about ancient Greek civilization. However, we have a third engagement in promoting the cultural exchange between Sweden and Greece. Traditionally, this has meant introducing Swedish artists, writers, musicians to a Greek audience in Greece. And indeed, we continued along this line in 2020 with two, present two presentations introducing Swedish crime literature set in historic milieu. Uh, Niklas Natodog presented his second book about a detective solving brutal crimes in 18th century Stockholm, and Nikos Georgiadis gave a lecture on historic crime novels in the Nordic countries. However, wishing to stress the exchange in cultural exchange, for the last few years, the Institute also present aspects of contemporary Greek culture in Sweden. For a second time, we co-organized Sundays of Contemporary Greek Film in Stockholm, this time via a digital platform. And we also continue our, continued our efforts to create Greco-Swedish networks of young artists um, and musicians. So, for example, the Kavala Jazz Sessions this year took the shape of a digital masterclass, bringing together Greek and Swedish students who learned about performing techniques by guitarist Andreas Sourdakis and about the beauty and possibilities of the triad from saxophone player Orpheas Vadig. As a member of UNIC, we participated, as usual, in the European Day of Languages. And I take the opportunity to thank Her Excellency, the Swedish Ambassador to Greece, Mrs. Sameling, and Mrs. Sofia Karamida for a wonderful cooperation in this and many other projects. Finally, our guest house in Kavala mostly had to stay closed to guests. The staff, however, kept very busy with all those tasks that do not take priority when the house is filled with guests. I would like to thank the curator Elisabeth Gulbay for her hard work during 2020. The interior of the house has never looked better and the same goes for the garden, which, is actually, which actually has protected status together with the unique Bauhaus building. I'm sad to say, however, that the much-loved plane tree that has shaded one of the terraces since as long as anyone can remember fell during a storm. When 2020 started out, an emergency renovation of the facade and roof terrace of our beautiful building was just about to be completed and we were all set for an intensive program. We all know what happened next and in, in February, but fortunately the facade is still gleaming and we still look forward to welcoming, to welcoming you all as soon as possible. I end my presentation by once again thanking the staff of the Institute who continue to work with zeal and optimism during difficult circumstances. 
I thank you for your attention. Και τώρα είναι μεγάλη χαρά μου να δίνω το λόγο στη κυρία προϊσταμένη της εφορίας αρχαιοτή των Καρδίτσας, στη κυρία Μαρία Βαϊοπούλου. Καλημέρα σα. Είμαι χαρούμενη που είμαι μαζί σας σήμερα και γι' αυτό θα ήθελα να ευχαριστήσω το Συνοδικό Συντούτο για την πρόσκληση. Όταν πριν μερικά χρόνια ο Ρόμπιν ζητούσε την άδεια για να επισκεφτεί τι Ακροπόλει τη Περιφερειακή Ενότητα Καρδίτσα από την οικία εφορία για τι ανάγκε τη δακτορική του διατριβή, κανεί μα δεν ήξερε ότι η θετική μα απάντηση θα ήταν η αρχή μια τόσο αγαστή και δημιουργική συνεργασία ανάμεσα στο Σιωδικό Ινστιτούτο και την Εφορία Αρχαιότητων Καρδίτσα. Το τριετέ πρόγραμμα VLAP απέδωσε πολύ σημαντικά ευρήματα και απάντησε σε πολλά επιστημονικά ερωτήματα. Ευελπιστούμε ότι τα αποτελέσματα που θα προκύψουν από το νέο πενταετές πρόγραμμα, το αρχαιολογικό πρόγραμμα Παλαμά, θα βοηθήσουν στην κατανόηση τόσο της οργάνωσης των πόλεων των ιστορικών χρόνων, όσο και του δικτύου των προϊστορικών θέσεων της περιοχής. Μέσα από το νέο διαχρονικό πρόγραμμα θα έχουμε την ευκαιρία να προσθέσουμε κάποια κομμάτια στο πάζλ των γνώσεων που αφορούν στο κοινωνικοπολιτικό γίγνεσθε της Δυτικής Ασταλίας. Ευχόμαστε, όπως έγινε με το πρόγραμμα VLAP, έτσι και με το αρχαιολογικό πρόγραμμα Παλαμά, να δοθεί ευκαιρία σε νέους επιστήμονες να έρθουν, να γνωρίσουν την περιοχή και να εντρυφήσουν στον πολιτισμικό πλούτο της Δυτικής Ασταλίας, ο οποίος τα τελευταία χρόνια, χάρη στη συνεργασία με άλλου φορεί και ιδρύματα, Αρχίζει να γίνεται γνωστό στην επιστημονική κοινότητα αλλά και στους κατοίκους της περιοχής οι οποίοι αποδέχτηκαν και αγκάλιασαν με αγάπη την όλη προσπάθεια. Θα ήθελα να κλείσω με μια ευχή και μια πρόσκληση. Η ευχή μου είναι να συνεχιστεί αυτή η άψογη και τόσο αποτελεσματική συνεργασία μεταξύ του Σουηδικού Ινστιτούτου και της Εφορίας Αρχαιοτήτων Καρδίτσας και να συνεχίζει να αποδίδει καρπούς. Η πρόσκληση αφορά όλους σας. Οι υπηρεσίε μας είναι ανοιχτή σε τέτοιου είδους συνεργασίες. Σας προσκαλούμε να έρθετε στην καρδίτσα, να σας δείξουμε τους χώρους μας, να συζητήσουμε μαζί σας τους προβληματισμούς μας και να μοιραστούμε τις δικές μας και τις δικές σας γνώσεις. Σας ευχαριστώ πολύ και καλή σας συνέχεια σε ό,τι κάνετε. And now it is a great pleasure to introduce to you uh, tonight's main speaker, Dr. Robin Rundlund. Dr. Rundlund was awarded his PhD in Classical Archaeology and Ancient History at the University of Göteborg and he is currently a Venegan Fellow based at the University of Thessaly. Uh, Robin Rundlund is a long-time collaborator of the Swedish Institute. He has participated in most of our archaeological projects <coughs> such as Makrakomi, Calavreya and of course Thessalian Vlochos. Uh, since 2020, he is responsible for the Swedish part in our excellent Synergasia with the effort of Kaiditsa. So I cannot think of a better person than uh, Robin to present uh, tonight's lecture, which is entitled The Greek-Swedish Work at Thessalian Blochos. Thank you, Mrs. Vajopoulou, for those very kind words. And thank you, Dr. Wallenstein, for inviting me to deliver this lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellencies, friends and colleagues, it's a great honour for me to present some of the results of the Greek-Swedish archaeological collaboration at Thessalium Vlochos. I am sorry that we are not all here at the beautiful Swedish Institute, but I hope that we can soon gather again here in Athens, in Thessaly or somewhere else in the near future. These are the fruits of a large collaborative team effort and the limited time scope of this presentation makes naturally that I cannot present all of the results of our investigations. This will instead be a more overarching introduction to our work, to the site and to its antiquities. The Greek-Swedish collaboration started in 2016 with the Vlochos archaeological project, or VLAP as we always call it, a three-year effort to completely survey the visible remains on the archaeological site at Blochos, employing non-invasive methods only. After the successful completion of this work, the team decided to embark on a more ambitious program, employing further archaeological methods to examine not only the site at Blochos, 
but also its immediate vicinity in the municipality of Palamas. This Palamas archaeological project was granted a permit by the Ministry in 2020 and was planned to run until 2024. However, due to COVID-19, we were not able to conduct any fieldwork as planned in 2020 and the programme has therefore applied to the Ministry for a one-year extension. I will not delve too deeply on our future plans, but instead focus on what we have achieved so far. I would, however, first like to briefly introduce the people and overall methods involved in our work at Vlochos, as there can be no archaeology without archaeologists. The Vlochos Archaeological Project, or VLAP, was co-directed by Mrs. Maria Vajopoulou, Director of the Effort of Antiquities of Karditsa, and Professor Helen Whittaker of the University of Gothenburg. Directing the work in the field were myself, Robin Rönlund, then of the University of Gothenburg, and Mrs. Fotinitsiuka, archaeologist of the Effort of Antiquities of Karditsa. The ongoing Palamas archaeological project is co-directed by Mrs. Vajopoulo and myself, with Mrs. Chuka continuing to direct the work in the field on behalf of the effort. The work employs several quite specialized archaeological methods, and we have divided our team into units depending on the assigned tasks. Directing the work packages are archaeologists Soteria Daddu, Johan Klange, Derek Pittman and Rich Potter. Our team over the past five years have included people from all over Europe and beyond, and I'm especially happy that many of our excellent former students have chose to return with us after the completion of their education. The archaeological site at Lojos is located at the northern edge of the Western Thessalian Plain in the modern regional unit of Karditsa, about five hours north of Athens. The area is very rich in archaeological sites of all periods of prehistory and history, and appears to have been continuously inhabited from the Paleolithic until today. The area around Vlochos is also the lowest part of the region, and several important rivers join close to the archaeological site, including the Apidanos, the Enipeas and the Pinos. As can be seen in this redrawn map of the area in 1909, the lower part of the plain was characterized by seasonal marshes, streams and meandering rivers prior to the advent of industrial agriculture in the mid-20th century. Today, the landscape has gone through a considerable transformation with artificial drainage canals and regular field divisions. The area still remains fertile, but the fields are now mainly used for the industrial cultivation of cotton, for which the region is well known. The archaeological site is located on and immediately below the hill of Strogilovuni, here seen at centre, which in turn is located just south of the village of Lojos, to the left of the hill in the picture. The hill and its immediate surroundings have been a protected archaeological site since 1964, but the ancient remains have been known to scholars since the early 19th century. Most of the few previous publications dealing with the archaeological site at Lojos have focused on trying to identify the remains with any of the cities known from ancient literary sources, ranging from Homer to Livy. The question of the identity of the site is still not resolved, and I'm sorry to say that we have, through our work, yet not found any evidence that could help in the identification process. In spite of being partially well preserved, the site has only been subjected to limited archaeological attention prior to our investigations. This is surely because of the difficult and demanding topography of the site, as well as the extent of the buried remains. The hill of Strogilovuni at Lojos reaches 313 meters above sea level and over 200 meters above the plain, with steep slopes facing most directions. Most of the ancient remains at the site are those of a substantial urban settlement, or rather a series of settlements. These were observed already by 19th century tra travellers, but the sheer size of the site and the difficult terrain has made that there existed no real plan of the site nor sketch of its remains until our present work. In short, the remains are concentrated on the hilltop, forming the acropolis of the ancient city, on parts of the slopes, but mainly in the flat area of Patoma, at the foot of the hill. As will be shown later, the inhabited area of the ancient settlements was almost completely limited to this location. 
Whereas the hilltop and slopes contain well-preserved remains of fortifications and buildings, the area of Patoma is nearly completely devoid of visible ancient remains. This varying terrain presents many challenges to archaeological work and calls for a multi-method approach. As there is no present threats to the archaeological remains beyond that of occasional goats, we originally decided upon a non-invasive approach, meaning that the site should be left in the same state after the completion of fieldwork as it was when we arrived. These methods complement and influence the results of one another, providing ample results for archaeological interpretation at a fraction of the cost of conventional excavation or fieldwork. This said, they cannot fully replace the latter two methods when it comes to understanding chronological and ceramic sequences, but in a case of such a large and virtually unmapped multi-period site, the use of our set of methods have proven extremely productive. By systematically trying to walk over as much of the archaeological site as possible, our preliminary pedestrian survey aimed at getting a rough outline of the archaeological remains in order to allow them to be properly mapped at a later stage. Using a small handheld GPS, points of interest were recorded and added to the project GIS to be revisited during the architectural and geophysical surveys. The topographical survey was mainly conducted using small unmanned aerial vehicles or drones, taking photographs in both the conventional RGB and in the near infrared spectrum. By amassing tens of thousands of vertical and oblique photographs and combining them with exact coordinate points, we were able to produce an accurate topographical model, which can be used as a reference map in the project GIS, as well as to highlight the various aspects of the terrain, as in this red relief image. This was done using photogrammetry, or structure from motion, a set of technologies that are becoming increasingly important in archaeology. The aerial photographs also allowed for a georeferenced and high-resolution photomosaic of the ground. This combined image greatly assisted the preliminary pedestrian survey as it allowed us to spot features in inaccessible locations such as in the steep slopes of the hill. The architectural survey aimed at digitally record, photograph and describe all visible structural remains on site. Most of these are relating to the extensive fortifications on the hilltop, but all building foundations on and below the hill were also recorded in the same way. The measurements were collected using NRTK GNSS GPS systems, which provide portability with extremely high accuracy. Geophysical prospection was conducted mainly in the area of Patuma below the hill. Here, several methods were employed, including ground penetrating radar. As can be seen on the slide, the ra this radar unit was dragged over the ground using a small tractor, with a total station collecting exact coordinates for each reading. Magnetometry contrasts with the radar survey in that it is a passive technique that reads subtle changes and anomalies in the Earth's natural magnetic field. The results give indications of areas of greater magnetism, which includes places of burning, compacted street surfaces or collapsed collapsed tiled roofs. The great portability of the units, as well as the suitable geology on the site, made for the great success of this method, as will be shown later. Minor tests with a third set of methods, including georesistivity survey, was also conducted in the Patuma area. This technique measures how electric currents travel through the soil and encounter areas of less or greater resistivity resistance, giving indications of buried remains. The results were very promising and we aim at expanding this survey in the future seasons. Here I would have introduced our excavation methods, but due to COVID-19 we did not manage to conduct any excavations in 2020. These have been postponed to this year and we hope to open our first trenches on site in September. However, as part of the new Palamas archaeological project, we managed to conduct some invasive archaeology in the area of Patoma, but only as part of cleaning operations. During the mid-20th century, and prior to the declaration of the archaeological site, a large quarry had opened in the middle of the ancient settlement. To get access to the rock face, the quarriers had removed substantial masses of earth using mechanical excavators, and the soil had been left in large heaps next to the quarry, 
after it was closed in the 1960s. As the spoil heaps covered a large section of the ancient settlement that could consequently not be geophysically surveyed, and it was clear that the soil contained much dislocated archaeological material, we decided to sieve through and relocate the soil to the abandoned quarry, thus partially restoring the archaeological site. A custom-made mechanical sieve was used for this purpose, propelled by a small tractor. This setup allowed us to quickly work through the substantial masses of dirt, rubble and quarry debris. The soil turned out to contain considerable amounts of archaeological artefacts, are severely ex situ. The latter made that in spite of the richness of the material, the sieving should not be regarded as an excavation, as there were no contexts. The material, mainly ancient roof tiles and pottery, was mixed with much rub modern rubbish such as beer bottles and pieces of broken machinery. As a combined material, however, the pottery and other finds provide a cross-section of the chronology of the site. We are in the process of washing and conserving the material, some of which will be shown later. The results of the non-invasive survey and the preliminary observations of surface and spoil heap material provide us with a relative chronology of the archaeological site. This chronology also reflects the general use of the site, revealing at least four discrete building phases, probably separated in time by up to several hundreds of years. Even if most of the remains at Vlochos relate to urban settlements, there are some that do not. This is especially the case with the remains of Phase 1, which we tentatively date to the late Archaic period. This first phase of activity relates mainly to the construction of a large hill fort on top of Strogilovuni. The fortification walls of this enceinte runs for 1.3 kilometers and encompass approximately 11 hectares of rocky, barren ground. The walls are generally over 3 meters wide, sometimes preserved over 2 meters in height, and are built in a crude polygonal masonry using stones of an over 1 meter in size. There are no towers in the fortification wall, and the only discernible features in the otherwise unbroken circuit are two large gates, located in the west and southeast parts of the enceinte. The most well-preserved of these is the one in west, which in spite of being located close to later fortifications, for some reason had been spared from destruction. This gate is of a tangential type, protruding from the wall trace by 135 degrees. The gateway is approximately 3.5 meters wide and runs for over 10 meters. Judging from the sloping of the terrain, and the, this gate must have been of considerable height, and just as the adjoining fortification wall was probably partially built up in mud brick masonry. The gates open towards two monumental terrace roads on the hill, top, hill slope, one in the south and one in the north. The most well-preserved of these is in the north, where it still provides easier access to the hilltop than by scaling the steep slopes. The preserved length of this road is over 1.2 kilometers, which probably corresponds to the original length of the less well-preserved south road. Both roads are between 4 and 6 meters wide, and are supported by quite substantial walled terraces in the same type of masonry as the fortifications of the same phase. This, and the size of the gates, suggests that the constructors of the Phase 1 Hillfort complex aimed at making it more accessible for horses and even carts. A possible interpretation of this is that the hill was used as a refuge for the villages of the surrounding region. As there are virtually no remains of any settlement on the hilltop, and the lack of fresh water makes it unsuitable for permanent habitation, it's highly probable that the remains of Phase 1 are not of an ancient city. We have not been able to connect the fortifications with any datable ceramic material, but the lack of towers and the general layout of the remains are suggestive of a pre-classical date. We have therefore tentatively interpreted the remains of phase one as archaic, late archaic, that is, of the second half of the 6th century BCE. Some of the pottery and finds of the spoil heap below the hill are of this period, including this fragment of an Attic red figure plate, which can probably be attributed to the Athenian workshop of Parseas. 
Even if this type of pottery normally provides very exact dating evidence, we should note that this spoil heap is located at a distance from the fortifications and roads on the hill. A late archaic date for the first phase complex is therefore still only tentative. The following phases of habitation, however, can be dated with much more confidence. We have divided phase 2 into two sub-phases, as two main rounds of building activity can be observed, but without any apparent hiatus in habitation. Towards the end of the Classical period, probably in the second or third quarter of the 4th century BCE, an ambitious building program was embarked upon on and below the hill. This included the construction of a large walled enceinte, which encompassed the whole area of Patuma at the foot of the hill, the south hill slopes and a large part of the hilltop. As mentioned, this building program did not interfere much with the fortification remains of phase 1, which were left more or less intact on the hilltop. The fortifications of this phase 2a, here marked in black, enclosed over 43 hectares of ground running for over 2.5 kilometers across the terrain. The walls are best preserved in the slopes, where they descend from the hilltop towards the plains in jogs or zigzag. The masonry of phase 2a is polygonal, with some elements of trapezoidal blocks at corners. The quality of the masonry is high, and the well-preserved sections are aesthetically pleasing. This is only valid for the outer face of the fortifications, however, as the inner faces were seemingly built up of rubble, which has collapsed nearly everywhere around the enceinte. The phase 2a fortification wall traversed the hilltop at its highest peak, but at some point, probably later in the Hellenistic period, this stretch of wall was removed, leaving only fragmentary traces of its foundations in the ground. Apart from these fortification traces, the hilltop contains scanty remains of buildings or activity. The most substantial is a large courtyard building with a central cistern, here seen at F. We find it possible that this building relates to a garrison on the hilltop, to which maybe the smaller structures at G also belongs. The other structures are more difficult to interpret, such as the large enclosure in rubble masonry on the summit at A, and the five cisterns cut into the bedrock beside it at H. X's mark identified quarries, which due to their locations probably mainly relate to the construction of this phase 2A fortifications. Probably in connection with the dismantling of the aforementioned stretch of fortification wall, the fortified area on the hilltop was expanded considerably. This marks phase 2B in our relative chronology, which should most probably be Hellenistic in date. As can be seen in red on the plan, a 600-meter arched stretch of wall was constructed on the hilltop towards north, containing 16 additional towers, adding 4 more hectares to the fortified space. Probably at the same time, a cross wall or diatechisma was built around the top of the slope, connecting the descending walls, thus creating a separately fortified acropolis on the hilltop. The fortifications of this phase 2b are not as uniform in execution as those of phase 2a, ranging from quite well-preserved and well-built coarse polygonal and trapezoidal to nearly collapsed rubble masonry. This could suggest that the walls needed to be completed in haste, as there is no apparent trace of this being due to repairs. The cross wall, or diatechisma, also constructed, is also constructed in several different masonry styles, with some parts in coarse polygonal and trapezoidal, whereas other sections in coarse polygonal, reusing some of the stones of the phase 1 terraced road. As mentioned, the construction of the phase 2 walls did not include, include the reuse of any of the stones of the preceding phase, except for when the wall trace of the fortifications crossed over one another. For some reason, the constructors found it worthwhile to leave the several hundred years old phase 1 wall virtually intact and quarry new stones for the classical Hellenistic fortification. Maybe this was because of reverence for the significance of the phase 1 hillfort in the history of the area, as the ruins of the hillfort must have been quite visible from the surrounding plain. The fortified enceinte of phase 2b must however have been a terrific sight in itself 
with its large walls and towers visible from most of the western Thessalian plain. The steepness of the hill makes that such strong fortifications were probably not only for the use of defence, but also communicated a strong message of power in the surrounding landscape, still being visible for over 30 kilometres across the plains. Even if the walls are well preserved on top of the hill, there is virtually no trace of any fortifications at its foot, as most remains have been stripped of stone during the past centuries for the construction of houses in the surrounding villages. It is only through the geophysical prospection that we've been able to reconstruct the remains of the ancient settlement here, including the wall trace of the phase 2a and 2b fortifications, as they appear quite strongly in the magnetometric image. Descending the hill, the fortifications enclosed the whole area of Patoma and the remains of the ancient lower city, forming a 1.2 km long defensive line, in combination with the hilltop walls, a truly monumental complex of fortifications. That there was an ancient city at Locos was already known long before the start of our investigations. Our work, however, as can be seen here, allows us to fully understand the layout of this urban settlement, showing that it was a substantial and important city in the region. Not only fortifications can be seen in the magnetometric image, buildings, streets and open spaces appear quite clearly, providing us with a pretty complete picture of the outline of the building remains. The flat ground and lack of any substantial vegetation gave us the opportunity to survey this over 15 hectare area of ground. When I say lack of substantial vegetation, I mean trees and shrubs. The whole expanse of the Patoma area is normally covered in a kind of particularly nasty thistles, and we would here like to extend our sincerest gratitude to the municipality of Palamas and its mayor, Mr. Yorgo Sakilariu, for helping us mowing the whole place for us. We could never have got such good results without you. Magnetometry allows for a rapid survey as the units are highly portable and provide quick readings. As mentioned in the introduction, we did complementary geophysical surveys using other techniques in the same area, which confirmed and added to the results of the magnet magnetometric image. The most promising of these is definitely the resistivity survey, which produced very high resolution results in spite of being conducted in less than ideal dry conditions. We aim at expanding this survey to cover most of the ancient city over the coming field campaigns. Studying the results in more detail, we are able to observe typical examples of classical Hellenistic architecture in the magnetic image, such as can be seen in the upper example here, which is most probably a domestic structure or house at the north side of a large avenue-like street. Below it, we see a square enclosure on a small platform in the lower slopes, with a central smaller structure and an elongated building at its north end. The high magnetic response, the black in the latter, is indicative of a collapsed roof. The layout of this complex and its location on a visible platform makes that we interpret it as a possible sanctuary. The surface find of a stamp roof tile of the late classical period at this location further supports this interpretation. The inscription can be restored as two or four Zeus Thaulios. Zeus Thaulios was a deity worshipped mainly, if not solely, in ancient Thessaly, with, cult, with cults noted at several ancient cities in the region. If this figure is that of Zeus Thaulios himself, then it constitutes, to our knowledge, the first depiction of the god, or his legs, rather. Combining the results of the architectural and geophysical surveys, we arrive at a near-complete image of the city of Phase 2a and 2b. This, in turn, allows for a tentative reconstruction of the settlement, as it probably appeared in the 3rd century BCE. Much of what we see is fairly typical of the period, including fortification, house and building architecture. What stands out, however, is the size of the Acropolis complex. To our knowledge, the Acropolis at Lokos is among the largest in Greece, and it's only exceeded by the grand citadels of Corinth and Sicyon in the Peloponnese. These traditional drawings are going a bit out of style, however, and we are currently in the process of turning our reconstructions into a full digital 3D model. 
Combining the architectural and geophysical results, we can use the GIS as a backdrop for reconstruction, thus creating a digital scale model in 3D, resurrecting some of the buried architecture. This is no exact work, but the reconstruction effort presents many challenges that focuses us to think and interpret our results in new ways, leading to new insights into the life of the ancient city. This is still very much work in progress, but the great pedagogical potential is evident. As the site is difficult to understand to most non-specialist visitors, we hope to be able to better communicate our results to the public through these 3D views. As said, the reconstruction work also forces us to interpret the remains in new ways. A tower and a wall become something more than just foundations in the ground, as we have to imagine how to access the tower from the wall, how one is supposed to get up on the wall, and so on. As we include the actual terrain in the model, we have to consider slopes, rocks and cliffs, and how these form the layout of buildings and fortifications. Building materials, shapes and forms of architecture need to be considered, paths and access way reconstructed, all to acquire a coherent whole. This work will surely take many years of continuous effort, but we hope to one day have a fully reconstructed, a full reconstruction of the ancient city, perhaps to be accessible online through a video game engine. Returning to the real world, the material found during seeding work of the spoil heaps generated by the old quarry contain many artifacts of the phase 2a and 2b, that is, of the classical Hellenistic city. Already in 1964, the quarry works had yielded several inscriptions of this period, published first by Agulos Liagoras and later in more detail by Jean-Claude Decourt. Our local informant, Mr. Teopoulos, who had guarded the rescue excavations in 1964, could confirm that the inscriptions were found at the same location as the quarry with the spoil heaps. These inscriptions are clearly relating to a sanctuary and consist of bases and votive stelae erected to an unknown deity. Our cleaning operations produced further similar material, including these three fragments of an inscribed 4th century votive stelae. The inscription is in the local Thessalian dialect, but unfortunately the heavy machinery of the quarry operations has obliterated the first two or three letters of the name of the dedicant. Interestingly, Two holes have been made in the stele, one still holding a piece of iron. This is probably a repair. The votive relief that once crowned the stele must have broken off and had to be reattached with an iron clamp. Fragments of other votive bases were found, including several of this votive semicolon, whose backs show that it must have been standing against a wall of some kind. To our great surprise, however, the soils of the spoil heap did not only contain fragmentary pieces of votive bases, but also the actual votives themselves. This somewhat worn votive relief was found nearly in one piece, but had been broken by the handling of the quarry excavators. It shows a standing female figure beside a horse in front of what appears to be an altar. The horse the horse attribute and the Thessalian context is evidence for the figure being that of Enodia, just as Zeus Thaulios, a deity almost exclusively worshipped by the ancient Thessalians. Enodia and Zeus Thaulios are interestingly known to have been worshipped in the same sanctuaries, but whether this was the case at Lochos, we cannot say. The clothes of the figure are similar to those of a statuette, also found in the same spoil heap, which we also interpret as a votive. Even if the arms are missing, there are some striking similarities with a votive statuette of Enodia found in her temple at Thessalian Melitaia, northeast of Lamia. The large torch is together with the horse, another of her main attributes as a goddess of the underworld. This is not preserved in this particular statuette from Lokos, but we have an isolated fragment from the spoil heap of a hand grasping what is probably a torch, with a similar example again from the temple of Enodia at Melitaia. Our hand fragment is from a different, somewhat larger statuette, of which we have no further fragments. The torch features, however, in a final, nearly complete votive statuette from the spoil heap. Luckily, we were able to find the head of this figure, which bears many similarities not only to the statuette found at Meritaya, 
but also to this similarly sized statuette from nearby ancient Karanon, close to Larissa. The torch and horse attributes are strong indicators that the inscriptions and votives from the quarry at Vlokos belong to a sanctuary of Enodia, a goddess whose main sanctuary was at Ferai at modern Velestino outside Volos. As can be seen in this well-preserved votive relief from Kranon, Enodia was also associated with dogs. And we actually have a fragmented terracotta figurine of a dog from the same spoil heap, further supporting this interpretation. The soils also contain fragments of architectural members, including pieces of Doric capitals and large slabs, probably of the Ephinteria of a monument monumental building. We find it probable that these were dislocated together with the votive material during the quarrying activities in the mid-20th century, and what we see in the spoil heap are the destroyed remains of a classical Hellenistic temple or sanctuary. The main temple of this temple or sanctuary was probably Enodia, but there is additional cult-related material that cannot as easily be connected to this particular goddess. This includes this attic or atticizing votive relief with three fi female figures, none of which depicted with any discernible or identifiable attributes. The relief could be relating to the cult of Enodia, of which we know relatively little, but there is nothing that to us connects it with this particular goddess. More definitively, apart from the cult of Enodia, is this half clay disc, which we first interpreted as a matrix as it has a negative imprint on one side. After conservation, however, it became clear that this disc had been produced by pressing clay against an item in relief, producing the negative imprint, as finger marks and, marks and even fingerprints are clearly discernible on the back. It is still possible that the disc was meant to be used as a matrix, however, but it's rather a direct copy of an original than an original mold. The negative imprint shows a draped figure Stand, standing holding a bird in one hand, towards which a smaller winged figure is reaching. Unfortunately, more details cannot be discerned. However, a similar image can be seen on another clay disc found at Calithiro, close to Cardiza. This clay disc, found in a tomb, shows a standing female figure holding birds in each hand, with smaller winged figures below her reaching for the birds. Coinage of the nearby Thessalian city of Metropolis, issued in the Classical and Hellenistic periods, show the same scene. The figure has here been universally interpreted as that of Aphrodite Castnetis, which according to Strabo was the principal deity of Metropolis. Why a clay disc with this figure was found among material mainly relating to Enodia, we cannot know, and it's not certain that it comes from the same original context as the soils from the quarry are quite mixed. As we have yet not conducted any excavations, it is difficult to state the fate of the classical Hellenistic city with any confidence. We have yet not identified any material clearly belonging to the 2nd or 1st centuries BCE, and as the literary sources, mainly Livy, states that the cities of the region were all destroyed during the Second Macedonian War in 198 BCE, it is possible that the city was abandoned at this point. Long after the supposed date of abandonment, and again at the tentative date, we encounter evidence of new building activities at the site of Lojos. This phase 3 can so far not be discerned on the ground, and was first observed in the magnetometric image, in which a line of fortifications appear. These fortifications cross over the street grid of the classical Hellenistic city, showing that they are of a later date than the phase 2a and 2b period. The upper part of the fortification appears to have been completely robbed out of a, at some point in the modern era, as a long robber's trench is visible on the ground. The fortification is confined to the east part of the Patoma area, and seemingly made use of the classical Hellenistic fortifications in its south and east part. Within it, the street grids of the Hellenistic city was partially reused and partially modified, with a large gate opened over the Hellenistic main avenue in the west. The exact details of the buildings within this ensemble were not as discernible in the western part, as in the western part of Patuma, as this area had, has been used for a shooting range, with much magnetic rubbish on the ground distorting the picture. 
Snowy winter in Thessaly, however, gave us a surprise opportunity to trace the layout of, the, of this phase 3 settlement. As temperatures rose after the snowfall, the ground which covered buried structures were ever so slightly warmer than their surroundings, which made that the outlines of houses and buildings could briefly be seen as patches in the melting snow. Interpretation of crop marks have been standard archaeological practice for many decades, but to us this marks the first occurrence of snow marks in Greek archaeology. As can be seen in this rectified image of the eastern part of Patuma, the melting snow revealed a dense network of lines and rectangles, most probably of buried structures and buildings. Tracing these, we see a street grid with large insulae or house blocks, as well as parts of buried fortifications. Nearly everything that we see here relates to phase 3 at Bochos, which, using other sites on the Greek mainland as par parallels, we date to the Roman period and possibly the 3rd century BC, the 3rd century CE. The discernible architecture are, are of substantial building complexes, often surrounding large courtyards, as in, per, interpreted in this tentative reconstruction sketch. There are parallels of such urban residences from other parts of the Roman Empire, and we plan to conduct further geophysical surveys in this area to acquire more detailed plans of the building complexes. Why this fortified settlement or town was built in the 3rd century can possibly be explained by the Gothic invasion of the Bal Balkans during the so-called crisis of the 3rd century, when fortified settlements were again needed after several hundred years of relative peace. When or why it was abandoned we don't yet know, and it's probably only through excavation that we may acquire an answer to this. Some 150 years after the crisis of the 3rd century, Thessaly was yet again under threat from invading so-called barbarians. Procopius mentions that the Emperor Justinian instigated the renovation of the fortifications of several Thessalian cities and fortresses in the early 6th century to act as refuges for the local population. Remains of one of these renovations or restorations can most probably be seen at Vlokos. The classical Hellenistic southeast descending wall of phase 2a was at this point built up to a considerable height, but much more narrowly than previously. Several towers were added to the wall trace using the collapsed blocks of phase 2a, but joined with mortar, making them quite distinct from the older classical Hellenistic dry masonry. The area of Patuma was not included in the fortified area, however, as a new wall was built along the base of the hill above the Hellenistic and Roman urban settlements. Much tile and pottery eroding down from the slope from this area show that it was probably built up with houses and other structures, but the same erosion has made that this area is covered in up to two meters of colluvial soils, making it hard to discern any distinct features. The Justinianic date of these fortifications is supported by these two coins, found by a private citizen on the ground in erosion masses below the fortifications. The spoil heap contained further distinct chronological material from this period, including this stamped roof tile with the name of Sosikratos, either a tile maker or a magistrate, and African type lamps, this possibly of a Demetrias workshop, both of the early Byzantine period. The spoil heap has also produced much other pottery and tile of this period, which are yet to be studied. It appears at present that the settlement of this refortification was mainly located behind the fortification wall in the lower hill slope, which makes it a relatively small settlement, at least in comparison with the size of the classical Hellenistic city of Phase II. A final structure of this phase deserves to be mentioned, which in contrast to the rest of the Phase IV remains is located on the actual hilltop, some 500 meters north of the early Byzantine settlement. A large pile of rubble collapse partially covers a small three-aisled church constructed right on top of the southeast gate of phase one. Early Byzantine roof tiles found among the rubble support the association of these remains with phase four. This is the only identified Christian structure on the site and it constitutes one of the earliest examples of Christian architecture in the surrounding region. The early Byzantine settlement at phase 4 appears to have been relatively short-lived, as the restoration of the Hellenistic walls was never completed. 
There are only very few remains of any habitation activity on the site after the 6th century, and it appears plausible that most of the population must have relocated to the surrounding countryside. Modern Palamas, only 2.5 kilometers south of the site, probably constitutes the modern functional descendant of the cities at Lojos. Today, the site is nearly completely devoid of any buildings, and to many of the local inhabitants of the region, it is difficult to imagine that once the barren thistle fields housed a large and imposing ancient city. This is also why our work is not intended for scholars, but for the general public. In order to protect this wonderful archaeological site, it is important to raise awareness about it among the modern inhabitants of the plain. This has not proven too difficult. The interest and enthusiasm in our work shown by the locals have been truly heartwarming. As an example, the public presentation of the Vlochos archaeological project on the central square of Palamas in 2018 filled all available seats, leaving many people standing. The site at Vlochos, which was formerly a relatively unknown site in the area, is now transforming into a place in people's lived landscape, with the recently put up signs welcoming both new and old visitors. For those of you more interested in the site and our work, the complete results of the 2016 to 2018 field campaigns have been published in Opuscula, the journal of the Swedish Institute, Institutes at Athens and Rome. The article will be freely available open access in a few weeks by using the link on screen, and the results of our future work will also appear in the same journal. By this, I would like to express my and the team's sincerest gratitude to the many people and organizations without the help of which we would never have been able to carry out this work. Θα ήθελα να ευχαριστήσω το Υπουργείο Πολιτισμού και Αθλητισμού που μας παραχώρησε την άδεια να εργαστούμε στο βλοχό. Θα ήθελα να ευχαριστήσω το Πανεπιστήμιο του Γκέτεμποργ και την καθηγήτρια Helen Whittaker και το Σουηδικό Ινστιτούτο Αθηνών και τη Διευθύντρια του, Dr. Wallenstein, για την ατέρμονη βοήθεια και τον ενθουσιασμό της. Τέλος, θέλω ειλικρινά να ευχαριστήσω την εφορία αρχαιοτήτων Καρδίτσας και ιδιαίτερα τις συνεργάτηδες και φίλες μου, την κυρία Μαρία Βαγιοπούλου και την κυρία Φωτεινή Τσούκα, για την εξαιρετική συνεργασία μας όλα αυτά τα χρόνια. Ήταν πάντοτε χαρά και ευχαρίστηση να δουλεύω μαζί σα στο πεδίο και ελπίζω και είμαι βέβαιο ότι θα συνεχίσουμε τη συνεργασία με μεγάλη επιτυχία για πολλά χρόνια. Κυρίε και κύριοι, εγώ και η ομάδα σα ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Robin, for this wonderful lecture. I would very much have liked to be able to welcome you to a reception after this fantastic lecture and to finish the evening. However, the invitation rests open for next year. Thank you very much for listening and for your attention.